And maybe I can add the, the caption because uh, we will um, post some, some part in our Instagram so our audience in Indonesia can see the caption. So mm. can you do that? So your like, your voice is really uh, breaking up, Nikita. And I don't know oh, if there's some really? kind of um yeah uh multiple. Maybe you are in the same room. So yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I will move to another room. Is it okay? All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's pretty funny because uh, Nikita's on the left. Rough. Yeah. So moon, sorry for this. on the right, and they look the opposite way, right, but they're looking at each other. It's funny. <laughs> Okay. Or you can be in the same room, but one of you need to mute. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I will unmute myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, firstly, uh, I want to thank you for Dr. C and Dr. Yitong for coming to this podcast. Uh, actually, uh, we're having a podcast, so uh, for... Uh, our social media content is it is it okay, Mister Doctor C? Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly. Okay. Okay. Uh, so hello and welcome to the first Kokamuki podcast. I'm Noval as your host, and I'm accompanied by the founder of Kokamuki itself, Kanikita. Hello, Ka. How is your day, Ka? I'm good. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for giving the opportunity. Uh, anyway, our pod, our first podcast, uh, we are having guests from University of Toledo, Ohio, United States. Uh, he is a, he is Dr. Kevin Zajkowski, or called Dr. C. He is a re research and his and her and his research assistant, uh, Dr. Yi Tong Chen, or called Dr. Yi Tong. So let's get started. Hello, Dr. C. Hello, Dr. Yi Tong. Hello. Hello. Thanks for being here. It's an honor to be able to talk with you. How is your day, Dr. C? Oh, it's, it's very nice. And I was uh, looking at we are expecting a snowstorm here in oh, Ohio sure. and Michigan. And it's very exciting because it has been a quite quite a warm winter so far. Uh, even oh, yeah, though yeah. Meteor meteorological winter ended on March 1st, it's now meteorological spring. <clears throat> and meteorological winter is December, January, and February. So how do you feel by the weather? Uh, do you feel uncomfortable or? Uh, I, I'm excited. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're, you're I, excited. <laughs> yeah, I became a meteorologist because I, I love snowstorms. Um, okay, okay. Now, later today, we have to go get my youngest son, Timmy, at college, and we have to drive. So we're going to be driving in the snowstorm. So that might be um, nervous or nerve wracking. But, but I'm, I'm used to driving in snow, so I can do it. Yeah, uh, I hope uh, you are well. Uh, just be careful, doctor. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. What about uh, you, Dr. Yi Tang? How, how's your day and how's weather in your area? Uh, Dr. C and I are in the same area. It's uh, Toledo, Ohio. Oh, oh. Yeah, oh, yeah, in uh, Midwest United States, just beside Lake Erie. Um, so I feel this year the spring comes early. Yesterday, when I was uh, walking in the park, I, I see there's a um, uh, the, the, the trees uh, and the grass start to grow and uh, become green. Wow, so it is a good season. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. C, you are currently a professor at University of Toledo. You teach about climate and weather there. Is that right, Dr. C? Yeah, that's, that, that is correct. And I also teach about yeah. remote sensing. So it's looking at the earth from space. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And you, you are currently also involved in NASA's project called NASA Science Activation Program or sci -Arc, sci -Arc. And that, that, you're, That's right. Oh yeah. 
and you are also joined in Globe Earth Mission Program as principal investigator. Yes, Dr. Yes, and um, this NASA project is to work with students and teachers in the United States and to help them understand how to do science, how to take observations and uh, analyze the data and ask research questions and then present those results. And another aspect of that is though uh, building their own instruments. So having students build their own weather instruments. So, so it is a program, uh, a worldwide program, Dr. C. Well, that's true that the GLOBE program is worldwide. Uh, my funding is for the United States and not worldwide, but I get to work with people all over the world anyway. And uh, wow. right now, right now we're doing the urban heat island intensive observation period. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a meeting this week with students from Ireland, Malta, and Israel. They're working together to have a research campaign to study the urban heat island. Okay, so uh, your focus are now in uh, urban heat island, Dr. C, right? It uh, is, and I, we've done that for quite a long time, maybe 15 years, but it's now wow. a very interesting topic in the United States, well, and around the world. Yeah, it's uh, quite interesting since um, uh, the climate change issue is now uh, brought up to the society. And um, it is said that you were interested in this field because of there were a blizzard in your place. That, that, that's right, a big snowstorm. And yeah. I got to miss school for one week. And I love missing school. <laughs> I, lo I love <laughs> to have snow though. days, the same as you, okay. Um, <laughs> so in the Northern United States, when there's a snowstorm or ice storm, uh, the students don't go to school. Uh, and in the southern United States, it might be due to a hurricane, which I think is called a typhoon or cyclone where you are. And um, so, you know, th that's always fun not to go to school. Yeah. And ever since you, you are uh, interested in this field. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I wish there were winter season in Indonesia too. <laughs> I've never been to uh, outside Indonesia actually. <laughs> okay, well, you, you, maybe someday you can travel outside of Indonesia. I hope and so. Ex experience cold. I think this the students yeah. that come to the University of Toledo, they experience the cold, and they're usually very cold. <laughs> it it takes oh, yeah. a few years to get it takes a few years to get used to it. Now you are, um, you may think about applying to graduate school in the United States uh, because we have lots of graduate programs in engineering. Uh, of course, geography is the graduate program I work with. And uh, yeah, it's, it's something to think about. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll consider to, to take my master at the uh, United States someday. <laughs> and uh, but Dr. Yitong, so Dr. Yitong currently a research associate at University of Toledo. Is that right, Doctor? Yes. And uh, you're also taking part in NASA's project uh, along with Dr. C. Yes, actually <laughs> Dr. C is um, uh, my advisor in my master's program. So mm -hmm. I, I was originally from China, and uh, yeah. when I came to the United States, my first stop is uh, Toledo, Ohio, and Dr. C was uh, my first advisor. And uh, okay, uh, yeah. So so there's a uh, um, uh, lots of uh, uh, you know uh, study and lots of uh, process with uh, Dr. C, <laughs> and uh, after that, um, I went to um, Indiana to get my PhD. Uh, and after that, I came back and uh, uh, work with Dr. C again. Uh, have you ever think about uh, coming back to your hometown, which is in China? 
maybe someday or um <clears throat> not not really not not a uh, <laughs> um i uh, i i like the uh atmosphere in uh this country and uh, i i like the environment uh, um the working environment in the united states too um i uh, when i was uh, just came here i didn't plan uh, to stay here that long but uh, yeah. uh, after several years gradually getting used to the environment i i start to uh, you know, enjoy um, the, the people and the, the environment more here. Oh, wow. So, and you said that uh, you came all the way from China to USA to take a master and PhD program. Right. Uh, maybe uh, we, uh, we're just going to get into the topic. So, uh, our title of the podcast is Calling Our Cities, Tackling the Urban Head Island Effect to Achieve Net Zero Emissions. Um, firstly, I want to uh, ask about uh, what defines an urban head island, maybe from Dr. C. Yeah, thanks. Uh, an urban heat island is an area that's warmer due to having buildings and parking lots and roads and less vegetation than rural areas in general. Um, what we found though, is that urban heat island can be even for a very small village or in, in the United States, it's called a village or a town. Um, because you know, we look at this urban heat island, we, we think of big cities having urban heat island, uh, you know, like in China, Beijing, New York City, Washington, DC. But then we see small towns, like even where I live is Ida, Michigan, and it's a little bit warmer inside the uh, area with all the buildings and outside the area of all the buildings. So that's what's interesting about our study with NASA and GLOBE is that we're finding these small urban heat islands. It's just, it's a little bit warmer in these small areas. It's all, okay. of course, in the big cities, it's a lot warmer than the rural areas around them. So the size of the city does matter in how impactful the urban heat island is. Yeah, and so it is caused by uh, numerous of uh, the gases like CFC and uh, other gases. Is that right? Well, well actually, no. Um, I think you're talking about the cl uh, climate change being caused by greenhouse gases of carbon dioxide, methane, oh, yeah. ozone, and uh, CFCs. When we're talking about the urban heat on the fact, we're talking about the way the energy budget interacts with the uh, surface. So when it's a vegetated surface, the energy from the sun comes in, it is absorbed or reflected from the surface of so the energy that's absorbed. In a rural area, there's water that might evaporate or transpire from plants and that cools the surface. Or um, the plants, they don't retain the heat very well. Whereas in a city, we have a parking lot that's very blocky and solid. And then there's buildings, there's not much water. And the sun heats the surface and uh, it, this, those surfaces retain the heat. The, the energy isn't turned into evapotranspiration. It isn't given off easily. So that's why the, the cities retain the heat longer. Uh, so then, especially at night, uh, a city will be warmer than a rural area. The rural area will cool off. Energy will be emitted to space, uh, cooling the earth, but not in the city. Uh, now, how does that relate to the, uh, uh, climate change? Um, some of the things like when you have an urban heat island, you everybody has their air conditioning on. So the air conditioning is producing greenhouse gases when you're producing electricity. Uh, but also warmer uh, cities allow ozone to form, that's smog. 
and ozone is a greenhouse gas as well. So that's that's another feedback with between urban heat island and uh, climate change. Oh, okay. So uh, the CFC and other gases, uh, it caused uh, the greenhouse effect. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, what is the impact to uh, human itself, uh, like health or others? Yeah, well, I mean, I even have a good example of my own son, Timmy. Um, he got a heat stroke at school. So it was very hot. And the school did not have air conditioning. And he went on the playground and he ran around, which he always does, got all hot. And he came into the school and it was hot. So he came home from school very sick. He had heat stroke. And I think he was sick for about a week. Um, now, this happens to people in the city. And, uh, and they, they might not doing, be doing a whole lot, but if it's too hot, they can get a heat stroke. Uh, some people even die. So that's a, a big issue. And the death rate is higher during heat waves than other times of year. Oh, yeah. So I'm so sorry for hearing that. Uh, I hope uh, your, your son and your family uh, are right. Well, and, this uh, was this was many years ago, so it's okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. This was. Um, but I use it as an example because uh, when students study their school grounds, they can see how warm it is on their school grounds and and understand how they might be affected by the urban heat island and and potentially their health with heat stroke when they're outside playing. Actually, uh, I've. Uh, feel like a different, uh, significantly different uh, when I uh, live in city. So uh, I live in uh, Jakarta, and and then uh, there was a time where uh, I was uh, invited by my family to go to the suburban areas, and I feel uh, a really different uh, of the weather there. Yeah. So uh, this is real and yeah, no one debate about it. What about- That's, uh, that's true. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Yitzang? Do you have uh, that kind of experience? Um, yes. Uh, my hometown is in Southwest of China and uh, it was uh, very humid in that area. So, uh, and uh, the humidity impact how you feel about the temperature. Um, so uh, in the summer, it feels uh, uh, hotter than the actual temperature is. And in the winter, um, it feels even colder indoors sometimes because of the humidity. Uh, and uh, after I, uh, uh, I come to, to here, uh, the, the feel is very different because uh, um, in the air, it's uh, like uh, there's uh, um, less uh, water vapor in the air. So the, the temperature feels different. Um, so, so that's why uh, part of my research is uh, um, also related to the surface moisture and uh, its relationship with the uh, surface temperature. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, uh, part of my experience. The first time you uh, lived in USA, uh, do you feel like uh, uh, maybe uh, shocked because of the weather and uh, causing you um, a sick or disease uh, because of the no. weather? No, no, no weather didn't cause anything. <laughs> Oh, and okay. the air quality here is pretty good. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. and the, and the, it's a very nice. Uh, it, you know, it's a very clear each season uh, in, mm. in this region. Uh, and because it's uh, close to Lake Erie, there's a lot of snow. Oh, yes. Uh, and you are also playing a skate in your background field. Is that right, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, can, could you say that again? 
you are also uh, love to play skate in your background field, or uh, is it is it Doctor C? <laughs> I I kind of forget. Oh, skate! Oh, oh ice skating! Yes, yeah, ice skating. I, I skate in the, my backyard. I'm hoping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. We are having. We are expecting well the snowstorm today and then colder weather next week. So I'm hoping that the ice rink will freeze back up. Uh, this year has been so warm. Uh, we only were able to ice skate for one week. Where last year we right, skated yeah. for three th with, for three months outside. So it was a much different winter than last year. Yeah, and uh, maybe uh, the next question is: uh, What are the factors influence the severity of urban heat island? Maybe from Dr. C. Okay, yeah, I'll start. Um, so the, the amount of buildings versus vegetation is a big contributor to the urban heat island. And I'm not sure about the height of the buildings, if that makes a difference or not, uh, but also the color of the surface. So the albedo is the reflectivity of the surface. Dark surfaces, more sunlight than light surfaces. And if you have dark, big dark parking lots like the University of Toledo, it absorbs a lot of sunlight and heats up, but also lack of vegetation. So um, there's some cities have a lot of trees and other cities have few trees. So if you have less, if there's less trees in a city, it's more likely to have a larger urban heat island. It also caused by the pavements and buildings, yeah, and also uh, the the color, as you said before, and less uh, vegetations. Okay. Uh, uh, what challenges that cities might face in mitigating urban heat island? Maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Yutong. Um, I think uh, for Toledo, um, Dr. C is uh, collaborating with the city on some like a tree uh, observations. Uh, so uh, he and uh, his class is uh, mapping how many trees are uh, planted in the city. And uh, the city is uh, facing one problem is that um, some of the older trees needs to be removed. Although people are planting uh, new trees, but it takes years for them to grow up and uh, really uh, have the full function uh, of, a, of a tree to mitigate the climate. So the struggle is uh, how to maintain the, uh, the green canopy in the city. Uh, that's uh, one thing. Uh, so uh, uh, there's, as the year goes by, I mean, uh, there are a lot of people uh, and also there are demography uh, increasing, right? Uh, and so uh, there, there will be an increases in uh, building and also houses. And so how do we uh, tackle that problem? And uh, also uh, plant trees. Uh, by the time. Maybe uh, you can answer the question. Well, I think you described the problem very well, is that there are more and more people moving to cities. And then the question is, how do you plant more trees? <laughs> and so I don't know, you know the answers are uh, plant more trees, but uh, it, it is up to the cities to figure that out. And you know, how do they, they have to pay for the trees? and then have people to um, plant them. And as Dr. Yitang had mentioned, maintaining those trees is, has a cost to it. Uh, we recently had an ice storm here in Northern Ohio and Michigan, and a lot of the trees fell over or broke, and then that, that knocked the electric lines down. And so people lost electricity. Um, that, it takes a lot of effort to then bring the electricity back uh, up and running. Oh, okay, sir. So 
uh, I'll go to the renewable and new energy. Uh, what is the most effective technology in renewable energy uh, that are existing now? Oh, I was hoping you're going to ask Dr. Yitang. <laughs> I oh, no, okay. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying it's a joke, but uh, I don't know the most effective renewable energy. Uh, I know that there are ways to implement renewable energy. And um, even at my house, we have geothermal for our heating and air conditioning. And so that's where we put pipes in the ground as well as. And then the furnace and air conditioning circulates water down in the soil and, and down into the rock. And it takes the heat from the ground in the winter, heat the house. And in the summer, the cool of, of the ground to cool the house. Um, and that's a way to save energy. Of course, there's a lot of uh, electric vehicles are starting to become popular. Uh, I have a hybrid car. So it uses gas, but also electricity. And um, that uses up less gasoline for the hybrid car. So I, I like that. But that's, you know, that's not generation of elect uh, electricity. Uh, of course, wind, um, we have had a lot of wind where we are this year, this winter. And a lot of, uh, like I mentioned, the branches and the trees have fallen over, but that would be really good for wind generation. And uh, solar cells are, have become much more efficient, but you have to have an area where there's sunlight. And currently in, in Ohio, it's cloudy. So oh. it's not a good day for solar uh, energy production. Uh, so wind in our area is better, uh, but in other areas, solar is better. Okay, uh, what about your opinion, Dr. Yitzhak? Um. I also don't know much about the renewable energy, but the solar um, solar energy is uh, definitely uh, one of one of those. Um, and uh, in in pandemic, lots of people needs to work from home and uh, get very. Uh, lots of people are depressed and uh, lonely. Um, and uh, so one of the things that. Uh, uh, people start to do again is go out to camping and uh, go out with the uh, RV, the recreational vehicle and uh, go, go, go out. And uh, uh, so another type of lifestyle is uh, like uh, off, off grid. So don't use electricity uh, at home, but uh, off grid using other type of energy. Um, so the, the solar, uh, solar panel that can be installed on that type of vehicle, the RV, um, uh, maybe will be popular and the technology of how to harvest uh, this type of energy and uh, how to increase the capacity of battery is uh, also uh, very trendy recently. And uh, also the uh, Tesla, you know, the, the car, um, uh, they, they, they are doing more research to get the price down. So um, the electrical vehicle and the autonomous driving um, maybe will be uh, more common in the future, very recent, like a, in a five year or something. Okay, so maybe uh, for now uh, is the solar uh, utilization is uh, probably the most effective way that's right. Uh, and so, uh, in accordance, in accordance with urban heat island effects, uh, what are the strategies that uh, government in uh, Toledo or in USA have uh, uh, emerged? Or yeah, what are the strategies? Maybe uh, what? Indonesia can. Apply it to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know one of the strategies is to plant trees. Uh, of course, the tree, trees planted here in Toledo are much different than the trees in Indonesia. Uh, so that's something that is uh, cared about, you know, try to figure out. 
Also, uh, I have seen where uh, roofs are painted white to reflect the sunlight away. Uh, I have been on a white roof before, though, and it's very reflective and can be very hot and give you, it gave me sunburn very quickly. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> <'Cause> gosh. <laughs> sunlight reflected off the, the yeah. roof. Um, interestingly, uh, areas in the desert sometimes are cooler in the city than outside the city. And that's because of water and like a, um, pe people, maybe they water their lawns to have grass or there's a, a pond or a, a fountain or something like that with water and that acts to cool it. I'm not sure how much water might cool an area in the north uh, a part of the country, but it might, you know, water features might be something to consider. Uh, I know when I lived near Washington, D.C., I did not have air conditioning in my car, and I had to drive from the University of Maryland to then to our apartment about um, an hour away, and about halfway through, there's a, a swamp, and the swamp was like a natural air conditioning. It was not so much nicer in the swamp. You know, so a swamp has water and plants. And so it, there's a lot of cooling there. Mm, okay. I'm not sure how many people want to put a swamp in the city, though. <laughs> but that could be something to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, maybe uh, plant more trees will be a great uh, options for uh, the strategies. Uh, and so, uh, in order to educate society about uh, these uh, urban hit island issues, we need more ties and more uh, uh, non-sophisticated uh, words, <laughs> because uh, it is uh, the issues that is, uh, uh, I think, it's too scientific for, for most people to understand. And so, uh, oh, what do you see to uh, tackle these uh, maybe uh, terminal terminologies, uh, maybe uh, barriers for educating the society aside from terminologies? Uh, maybe uh, you can answer, Doctor Yi Tong. Uh, can you ask the question again? Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, one of the barriers uh, in educating society to the urban heat island is uh, the use of terminologies, right? And uh -huh. so uh, how do we uh, tackle that problem and other, prob other barriers as well? Um, I think the podcast you're doing probably will help. And uh, <laughs> so it, it's uh, not doing, uh, you know, the scientific research uh, and uh, uh, some of the result is uh, only published in uh, that type of journal. Uh, and the language they use, as you said, has a lot of terminology and most people don't understand. Uh, and uh, maybe lots of people in that field, but not in that specific field do not understand what they are doing too. So I think what you are doing is very meaningful. Um, to interview the um, expert in these fields and uh, ask them to speak something you know the public can understand. And another thing is uh, when I was a student with Dr. C, I feel he is a very good, uh, good at teaching to bring someone completely have no idea about this field into this field. And um, the language he used and the example he used is uh, you know, very, very tangible and uh, uh, people like me can understand and uh, get into this field. So uh, I, I feel um, having uh, the educators like this and the training more educators that can uh, convey this information with a, a, a tangible language is also important. Okay, so use a tangible language, Dr. Uh 
And I also want to ask uh, to Dr. C, so there are a lot of solutions to tackle the uh, urban heat island or the climate change. Uh, one of the solution is nature-based solution or NBS. Uh, and as we know, as we all know that uh, mangrove trees are uh, uh, good at uh, absorbing carbon. Uh, and so uh, what others plan that uh, might be a uh, uh, good uh, absorb uh, carbon plants. Uh, yeah, so you're asking me what plants would be good at absorbing carbon dioxide? Yeah. Because yeah. you mentioned trees, and, and I think trees are probably the best. Um, I have some radical ideas, <laughs> which... Okay. You know, uh, since we, um, you know, fossil fuels are carbon we, we're taking out of the ground and then we're burning it and putting it in the atmosphere, that shouldn't we return the carbon to the ground? And one approach would be to cut down some trees that are older and bury them and then plant new trees to take up the carbon dioxide. So to me, I don't know, I don't hear people saying that. Um, strangely, uh, it, like in the United States, recycling paper and newspaper is common, but in a way it'd be better to bury the, the newspaper in the ground and then have new trees cut down to make the paper. But I'm different than other people. <laughs> so I yeah, just look I at just, that solution. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a long, long term solution, right? And in order to keep the carbon from uh, decaying, you have to have a moist area. So when you bury the trees or the paper, it has to be in a moist area so the, the bacteria doesn't break it down and release the carbon dioxide again. Um, and you you know you can see that in a swamp or a bog or a peat peatlands. This this is uh, organic matter or you know plant matter that hasn't broken down because it's moist. Okay, so uh, your solution is to bury down trees. Is that true? Have to see. Well, or or some kind of carbon. Yes, B bury yeah. the carbon. Um, oh yeah, very the carbon. In the United States, it's right now people are looking at well, how can farmers um, sequester carbon dioxide? Sequester means to take up. And what that means would be to have the plants they're growing, like corn, have the corn take up the carbon dioxide, but then putting it in their roots and then it has to stay in the field. But generally, uh, farm fields don't retain carbon. They cycle the carbon, but they don't retain it for long periods of time. Whereas a, a forest takes up the carbon, and but then if you bury it, I don't. And there might be some other way to bury carbon dioxide. I know that so there are factories that they sequester the carbon dioxide that they're putting either would release, and then they're inject, injecting it into a well, into the ground as a way to. Um, grab that carbon dioxide and not allowing it to go into the atmosphere. Uh, and, uh, and I've heard before about uh, maybe, I think it is uh, kind of similar to your idea, the carbon capture. Uh, so what is right. the difference? Yeah. Well, I'm not very familiar with carbon capture. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think it's some of this uh, putting things into a well. To, to bury basically bury that carbon, but I don't know exactly what what that all means. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, I'll I'll search about it later. Actually, uh, well, maybe <laughs> no. I will too. Yes, I, I have something to learn <laughs> also. Actually, uh, now I'm having a uh, uh, research. I'm conducting uh, research relating to uh, net zero emission. And carbon capture is one of my focus there. And so, uh, 
uh, as you mentioned earlier, that green infrastructure is uh, the key to uh, building cities. Is that right, Dr. Sik? Yeah, I think that is. Um, and, but as I think about it, even water, uh, a water body in the city will, can be helpful. Oh yeah, water and, and trees as well, right? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I want to ask about uh, green infrastructure, uh, like the material. Uh, what are the most uh, used material in green infrastructure? Uh, do I ask me first or Dr. Yitan? Uh, maybe Dr. C. <laughs> maybe. Oh, okay. Um, well, as far as I know, the most common green infrastructure considered are trees right now. Um, people do look at parks just in general, uh, which could include grass uh, and maybe some smaller bushes, but I think tree, trees are the main um, thing that people are thinking about to, to put into cities. Oh, okay, so what about you, Dr. Yi Do you have any other perspective? Uh, not really. <laughs> and so also oh, the trees are, are really uh, the key for uh, cooling cities. Uh, there's no other uh, options uh, as significant as trees. Probably not. That's right. Okay. Um, and you know, trees can be planted in a small area, but then they grow tall and have a canopy, and that's why their um, impact could be greater than the footprint of the tree on the ground. Okay. So, uh, maybe uh, I'll ask about the. Uh, sorry. Maybe uh, the use of uh, natural ventilation. Uh, and so, uh, is there any ventilation that designed uh, in a such way that uh, uh, reducing the heat from a building? Maybe uh, Dr. Yitong. Answer. Yeah, well, this is, okay. I, I haven't really um, studied natural ventilation, and I think what you're referring to is sometimes if you have the buildings and the wind may come through the buildings in a certain way to uh, help cool things, um, that's a very specific uh, architectural design and that I'm not familiar with. I haven't done any work with that. So it, it's possible to do that. I, I think there's other people that may know that. I think it's very that's a very specific um, oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. study sure. or or way to study things. Uh, I know there there are some buildings I've seen in, in the United States are designed to capture the wind and kind of for natural ventilation. But if if we're talking about an entire city, uh, I think that's quite a an an endeavor to figure out how the wind might come through the city. Oh yeah, sure. Actually, uh, there are some buildings in Indonesia that have uh, used the natural ventilations, but uh, unfortunately, uh, not as much as uh, the, the buildings are. <laughs> so uh, maybe uh, I want to ask about. Uh, the Globe Mission Program. So, uh, what is uh, what are the target of the Globe Earth Mission for Dr. C? Well, our 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 target or our goal is to have students do research projects and learn about science and how to do science. Um, well, by doing so, you know how they. They learn how to do science by doing it, <laughs> which may sound strange, but a lot of times 
uh, students in school, they learn about science and they don't actually do it. They don't go outside. And so our, we try to encourage that students go outside and with the GLOBE program, they can take observations of the atmosphere so they can observe clouds or temperature or precipitation. And then they can also study the hydrosphere. So looking at water quality, or they can look at the biosphere through um, trees and plants or the lithosphere, and that's looking at the soil. And so, you know, we, we, we encourage the students then to ask research questions. Um, how does uh, the land cover affect the temperatures might be a, a question that a student would ask. But, but to make it interesting to the students, we try to have them do something that they might like or be interested in. So many students look at, how does my playground affect the temperature? You know, is my playground too hot? Uh, or, um, you know, how does the parking lot at school affect the temperature? It could be a study. Uh, but then we have them analyze the data. So that's learning about data itself and data literacy. Uh, and it's, you know, not an easy thing to graph data or, or analyze it. And then they present their results. So we have many uh, different opportunities for students to present their uh, work. And what we find is it's important for students to learn how to talk to people, to talk in front of people. And uh, you are doing a great job of having this podcast and you're, you know, you're Thank speaking you. and yes, and, and um, uh, speaking to others. My youngest son, who's 19 and in, in college, maybe similar age to uh, you, uh, he thanked me because I made him do GLOBE projects all over the years and he had to go speak. So, you know, he went to Ireland and, and gave a presentation and he went to Colorado in the United States. He went to California and he had to speak in front of people. So now in his classes, when they have to do a presentation, it's easy for him to give that presentation. Uh, whereas, um, you know, other students are scared to give the presentation. <laughs> so you're saying I uh, get used to do presentation. Right, uh, yeah, to people he didn't know and from other countries. So that's also another um, important skill. Yeah, uh, regarding to your target in Globe Earth Mission Program, so you are more doing the practical than the theoretical programs, right? You do observations, uh, you do uh, calculate data and others. Uh, I would say that's so, correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been uh, in the GLOBE Transmission Program? Well, um, GLOBE, GLOBE was started over 27 years ago. And I joined it, I think it was about 24 years ago. So only a few years after wow. it started. Um, now, the GLOBE Mission Earth Project that we have funded from NASA, they got funded seven years ago. And uh, but it's a continuation of the work I've been doing for 24 years. And so uh, I started doing work with students and teachers because my aunt, uh, Diane, she was a teacher in a school for girls and she was teaching earth science, but she had never taken an earth science course herself. So I'd help her with lessons, you know, how, for, you know, how to observe the weather or the clouds. And then that turned into this whole career for myself. Okay. Uh, what about Dr. Yitzel? How long have you been in global admission program, Dr. Uh, it was since uh, 2020. I started uh, working in this program. I think uh, uh, one of the things I see recently in a conference is a uh, the supporting to the teachers. Um, so uh, lots of teachers, they uh, maybe they work in very small school and in that school only uh, their teacher is uh, um, teaching certain subject. So there is not much material and not much support. Uh, and But the uh, Globe Mission Earth is, uh, uh, you know, helping these uh, uh, science teachers uh, to yeah. do a better job with uh, lots of support. Um, and uh, 
uh, another thing I, I feel it is good is uh, uh, they connect the teachers together. So maybe in that school, there's only one teacher, but uh, in the school nearby, there might be other teachers. Uh, or in, in one school, the, the teacher is uh, teaching by him or herself. Uh, but the Global Mission Earth is um, having this uh, partnership together. So bring the teachers together. So they may have uh, some struggles in common and uh, uh, some difficulties in common. And uh, in, in this uh, hub, I would say, so, so people come together and uh, facing the, um, the same issue and uh, looking for the uh, solution together. I, I feel that's uh, uh, very helpful. And uh, they may find uh, um, the people in the same field having the same struggle and uh, they, they become, you know, uh, little clusters working together. I feel that's uh, very helpful for the teachers. Oh, yes. So the GLOBE admission program is not only uh, encourage the students, but also the educators as well. Yes. Uh, I want to ask Dr. C about your experience. So you've been in Earth Globe mission for 25 years, uh, and given that opportunity, uh, oh, what are uh, uh, so what are targets that you have been uh, real realizations in uh, this program that? Oh, so, so I think you're asking what what have I learned from doing the program over the years? Yeah, maybe your asking? experience, uh, maybe your experience and your uh, achievement. Well, I, I think I've learned that um, well, uh, teachers some are scared to try things. <laughs> um, like project it's called project-based sciences you know having students do these projects and they're scared uh because most of the time they're taught a different way even in in education courses the education professors they lecture they don't have the students do things so then the the teachers teach the way they were taught and they, they're very scared to try something new. But all the research, you know, researchers have looked at how do students learn best? And students learn best by doing things and by doing hands-on. And uh, they don't remember what people tell them. <laughs> so even this podcast, it's very nice, but the people listening to it may not remember much about yeah. what we talked about. They may, may remember this that I'm telling them that they won't remember much, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's important to, to do. And I think that's that's one of the great things uh, that your group is doing. Your group does things, right? Your group organizes meetings to have, um, you know, to, to look at science and technology, and, and that's a great great application. And it's not even your classes. I don't think this is extra. This is just people are interested in doing it. And yeah. I think that's that's yeah. a great part of education that I learned when I was uh, coming through school. I learned a lot from things that were not classes, that were um, you know doing activities. I, I was on the University of Michigan solar car team, yeah. so I helped build a solar car. You know, a car run by solar energy only. Wow. Uh, that was in 1990, so 33 years ago. Uh, I learned a lot from doing that. But anyway, that's my realization is uh, teachers may be scared, but this is what they should do, right? This is how they should uh, help their students. Yeah, so by the practical programs, uh, it might help uh, the student uh, to be more educated, uh, better educated. Right, and so yep. And so uh, we're currently building a community. Uh, what are your advice so that we can uh, scale up more and reach more uh, society and audiences? Well, I, I don't think I have much advice beyond what you're already doing. So 
uh, this uh, podcast is a great way to reach out to more people. I, I think that you've had meetings, uh, you have uh, common goals for the young people interested in these topics. So you're doing all the right things to grow your community. And I think uh, your passion, your interest uh, is a very important. And, uh, you know, we first met Nikita and she has a great passion and drive for these yeah. uh, the technology and the environment and then working with other people. And I think that's, um, that's the key. Okay, thank you for your advice, Dr. C. Uh, do you have, do you want to add? I'll tell you some uh, suggestion, maybe. Uh, yeah, I also like what you are doing. And also, we meet um, Nikita through the GLOBE program, and uh, she's a very passionate girl. Um, and yeah. uh, show, show it. so uh, doing lots of things is uh, not by obligation, not by requirement, is what she, she really want to do. Uh, so uh, that's uh, very inspiring. I think that will inspire young people, uh, like, like uh, lots of uh, young people like you, to to join you and uh, become the follower. So, oh, yeah, we, we need to be more passionate to this issue, to drive uh, the community better. Yeah. And so, uh, Maybe that is all for me. I'm sorry for uh, my uh, wrong words or something. <laughs> did, you, did, um, you did a wonderful job, a great job. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. C. Thank you so much, Dr. Yitzhak. Maybe uh, there's something do you wanna add, uh, Kanikita or uh, Andu? Maybe you can introduce your friend. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, um, uh, my friend uh, Andu is here. Uh, he's accompanying me. Uh, he's my team in my research. Uh, yeah, and he's uh, taking an accountant uh, bachelor degrees currently. Uh, and I've uh, maybe, oh. uh, <laughs> maybe you can say hello. <laughs> Hello, uh, I think uh, suddenly during this room meeting. Well, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, I am Andrew Fanda. I'm from team with Nova. Yeah, nice okay. to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Dr. C, Dr. Yitzam. Uh, I'll hope we, we can see you and discuss about it, about this issue uh, in another time. Sure. Thank you so Maybe, much for having us on. Yeah, th thank you so much. Uh, before uh, we leaving, can, can we take a picture? <laughs> Maybe. Oh yeah, I want to say something. I, I want to share the good news. So my community is starting to collaborate with uh, environmental care community in here. And yeah, I just want to share this good news with you because you inspired me a lot to do this thing. And yeah, my community still exists until now because of you. So thank you. And I just want to share this <laughs> good news. Oh, oh, very good. I'm sure it'll keep going well. Everything will keep going well. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let to see Dr. Yitzhak. Maybe... And when, you are, when you are done, uh, send us this episode. <laughs> I'm sorry? Send us this uh, episode of your podcast. The link, the link, send the link. Send them. Oh, yeah, I'll, I, I will, I will. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, we'll give you in about two days or three days. Yeah. Okay. Looking uh, forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you so much.
maybe we can start taking picture. I'll count from three to one. Three to one. How about the pose? How the how about the pose? <laughs> oh, oh, the pose. Uh, uh, maybe you have some suggestion, Dr. C or Dr. E. <laughs> well, you can do one regular and one uh, funny. Maybe like this one. <laughs> peace, <laughs> peace pose. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. So we do regular and funny? I don't know. Okay, we're doing uh, peace. All right, peace. peace, peace. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Other pose. I'm so sorry. Yeah. We do pose. Uh, peace pose. Peace pose. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, Dr. C. Thank you, Dr. Yitzhak. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hope we can meet again in another time. <laughs> nice to meet you and goodbye. Bye bye. 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 bye.